Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for turning up on this uh, Thursday morning for this 3D sound uh, panel. Uh, actually, we have a very exciting panel. Uh, we have Martin Black from Sky. We have John Dolan from Sky. We have Mark Basco from Dolby, and we have Chris Pike uh, from BBC. Uh, I'm Peter Schielebeck from Soundfield. Um, what we really want to achieve today is give a bit of an overview of 3D sound. Uh, there's been a lot of talk maybe for the last few decades about 3D sound, uh, but a lot of it has been uh, very much research-based, academic, and so on. Um, there's a lot of exciting possibilities there, uh, but the real question is, how can we potentially translate that into uh, the field of broadcast? So obviously that brings a whole other set of challenges uh, with us. Uh, what I like to do is keep it very informal, so any questions, once we get going, feel free to uh, throw them uh, to the floor. Um, we're going to get everyone to do a small, quick introduction, uh, as in what their kind of areas of expertise, what they're looking at, whether it's the research part, whether it's maybe uh, transmission with Dolby systems and so on. So you get a bit of an idea um, of what everyone uh, is about. Uh, and then we'll just, we've got a list of topics, we'll just go down it, and then any questions or anything you want to throw in, uh, feel free to do so. So, uh, Martin, you want to kick us off with a bit of background of what you uh, are up to? Uh, good morning, my name is Martin Black from uh, B-Sky B. From the production side, I'm a senior sound supervisor there. Uh, but the last few years I've been more involved. Thanks. Sorry if you couldn't hear me. Uh, Martin Black, B-Sky B. Uh, senior sound supervisor, but for the last uh, four or five years I've been more involved in the design work in, in Sky, so um, the, the recent uh, production facility that we built, nicknamed H1, Harlequin 1, uh, I did all the studio audio design uh, basis for that. Um, but another hat that I have is uh, along with uh, my co-chair Simon Tuff of the BBC, we, we co-chair uh, an EBU based audio group called the European High Definition Forum uh, Audio Group. Um, one of the things that that group did uh, was it was instrumental in the EBU paper R123 which uh, defines or uh, provides combinations of use of up to 16 audio tracks for particularly for multi-channel audio which is one of the briefs of, of our group is specifically about multi-channel um, so that's that's one of the aspects of what we might touch on today is, is the practicalities of what we might do with multiple audio tracks uh, so that's kind of my angle on it uh, my colleague John uh, Dolling has a mic of his own hello there um, so yeah my name is John Dolling I'm an applied researcher at B Sky B um, I've been at Sky for about 12 years uh, but probably about the last two years I've been working in our research group uh, I'm looking at uh, a thing called immersive entertainment so we're looking about how do we take Sky from where it is today uh, and deliver a more immersive experience for our customers. So that's everything from the, the video side going through to audio as well, uh, from the big screen down to tablets. So I'm, uh, you got me? Okay, so I'm Mark Pasco from uh, Dolby Laboratories. My main function is to liaise with broadcast operators, trying to understand what their requirements are and making sure that those requirements are met by our next generation of audio technologies and uh, deliverables. So aside from that, what I also do is um, I sit on the, the committees that decide upon the receiver specifications in Northern Europe. So I sit on the DTG receiver specification group and also on the Nordic receiver specification group as well. Just making sure that the broadcast requirements are, are met as closely as possible in those uh, in those horizontal markets um, as well. Uh, so my, uh, my interest in 3D audio <coughs> is really, and uh, this, what I can kind of bring to this discussion is how to get it from the operator to the end user in a, in a method that is uh, not gonna use up too much bandwidth. So we have a particular technology that we call Dolby Digital Plus, which is standardized as enhanced um, AC3, um, which uh, can currently be used for, for that purpose. But we're also interested in obviously expanding uh, you know, the number of channels or the methods of delivering uh, an excellent audio experience to the home. So, I'm Chris Pike, I'm from BBC Research and Development, um, and I perhaps work more on the research end of the spectrum, looking at, I keep using this, um, looking at the fundamental kind of signal processing and acoustics work. We do a lot of perceptual testing, so trying to push the, the for every, anything from sort of one to two years in the future to uh, 10 
and we work in collaboration with UK universities for a BBC Audio Research Partnership. So um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of collaborative research that goes on too. Very good. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview of um, you know the people we have here. Uh, the plan for right now was to, uh, for Chris Bike to give you uh, a couple of slides and a, a bit of a talk of uh, the exciting projects in 3D they have been working on. Uh, but as you can tell, uh, the laptop has now disappeared. Uh, so we're going to throw things around uh, a little bit. Um, whenever I mention 3D sound to uh, a lot of the broadcast audio community, uh, they kind of immediately turn around to me and go, you must be a little bit mad. Uh, people struggle to put 5.1 in their home. Where are we going to put uh, other, picture, uh, other loudspeakers? So I think a first thing here is it's a practical one. You know, if we want to deliver this in the home, how can we do this in a sensible way? Does it have to be over speakers? Maybe it can be over headphones. So to our panel, I think, you know, before we even start talking about how can we produce this live, how can we transmit this, is in, in a home environment, what, what's changing uh, at the moment with technology that might it make it more viable than actually putting 22.2 speakers throughout your living room? So, to the floor. I'll go first then, all right. Um, I think what's interesting is that if you look at the way flat panel development is heading, especially with these ultra thin screens, AMOLED screens, etc., that uh, probably sound is, is, is under attack more than it's ever been at the moment with these down firing speakers. Um, and I think the general public is starting to realise that. I can tell you now the CE manufacturers definitely know about it. Uh, and so you're starting to see things like you know, the, the arrival of sound bars and using uh, sound field uh, synthesis to try and improve that sound. So I think just the fact that the, the, the speakers in the TV are just going to be inexistent, that customers are going to have to start looking at alternative means to be able to play back that audio. Uh, and I guess that gives us more of an opportunity now for, for customers to go out and buy those, those sound systems. So that, that may lead it in that direction. Uh, from a Sky point of view, we're excited by uh, what we can do via tablets. So quite a few of our customers now are starting to consume content. As you know, we've got a Sky Go application out there that allows you go have your movies, sport, uh, Sky Atlantic. So I think there's an opportunity to there to try and uh, deliver a more immersive experience via your kind of binaural type experience as well. Um, one of the difficult things for, uh, for kind of put my product manager's hat on is just how you demonstrate this. What we do know is once you've experienced it, you, the customers then tend to go out and maybe invest into audio. And uh, certainly for myself, when we've got a 11.1 uh, demo unit at Sky, I kind of heard it. And I was just totally blown away by the fact that these kind of ones and zeros are creating this sound, generate this visceral type experience I had where I started smiling, thinking, this is just fantastic. Enough for me to go home and knock the wall down in my house uh, to my wife's displeasure. Um, so I'm trying to create that. And I'm, I'm not saying everyone's going to go home and knock the wall down, but I certainly think that once you've experienced it. So I think there's some challenges there we may want to discuss later on about how, if, even if we do develop it, about how you might go about demonstrating it. But I think a very valid point there is why are we talking about this? It's not a technical exercise per se. This, this is the backbone of it. The reason we're talking about it is to get more excitement into the home to make people more immersed into what's going on. I, I think we have to bear this in mind. You know, uh, Okay, this is a technical exercise in order to make this happen. But that's the end goal and that's the real reason uh, we're talking about this. So I think it's a, it's a very, very good point. Um, your laptop seems to be working. You want to ever just show you a, a couple of the things you've been working on yeah. uh, and stuff yeah. like that? That'd yeah, be no, that'd be good. Can you, is the clip on mic working? Does it sound right? Yeah. Better to use this. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd just do a quick introduction to some of the concepts in case it doesn't seem clear. So that's an image of a 5.1 surround sound system or 3.2 surround with a subwoofer. Um, and the next image is an example of 3D sound or a surround sound with height installation. So as you can see, there are speakers above and below the audience. Um, there's potential for many, many different arrangements of speakers, but this is what we're talking about potentially when we talk about 3D sound. There are lots of different ways of doing it. This is just one example. Um, I'll get used to this quicker. OK, um, that's just to demonstrate 22.2 has already been mentioned. This is. Um, a, a speaker configuration that's been pushed by uh, the Japanese broadcaster NHK. Um, the, as you can see, there's a lot of speakers. It's targeted for large audiences. 
Um, not everyone agrees that this is the best approach. Um, it's, it's just a loudspeaker configuration that gives you full 3D surround, and there are other approaches we can take too. Um, OK, and that's NHK's microphone array for capturing 22.2. .2. Um, the reason I put this up is because in the summer, we're going to be doing a public trial of 22.2 .2 for the Olympics. There'll be theatres in London, Bradford, and Glasgow. Uh, and a microphone array like this will be present in the Olympic Park, and we'll be streaming to these theatres and also over to Japan. Um, so some of the other aspects, there's, there's technologies out there such as ambisonics and object-based approaches. And fundamentally, what they're trying to do is give you a speaker layout independent um, representation of your audio. So for then you can, uh, you can render this to different setups and try and maintain the quality and the 3D scene that you created originally. And there's also surround sound over headphones, which was mentioned earlier, binaural techniques. This is about modeling the way that the head and the body uh, interact with sounds coming from different directions. So when you play back over speakers, if you model that, you can give the impression that sound's coming from anywhere around you, essentially. OK, so on to some, uh, some experiments that we've done in the past. In 2009, we went to the last night of the proms. Um, we captured all of the microphone signals. Um, and also, we placed a sound field microphone in the Royal Albert Hall above. And uh, this is commonly used to capture a five-channel surround signal, um, but you can also represent 3D sound fields using this. So um, we took all these microphone signals and we created our own 3D mix in our lab, um, which is a lot of fun to experience. And it's uh, just an example of trying to transport the listeners to the venue. Um, another thing we did uh, at the end of last year was to go to Manchester Cathedral when Radio 2 did uh, a live elbow concert um, it was broadcast on Radio 2 and available to watch on the red button on TV. It was broadcast in stereo, but we captured all of the microphone signals and again took a sound field microphone to capture the 3D ambience of the cathedral. Um, this is the custom mixing software that we put together to allow us to place the microphones in 3D space to, to then recreate the uh, 3D ambience of the cathedral. And um, people that have listened to this in our, in our studio really like you see the smiles erupt on their faces they're definitely taken to the cathedral um, and uh, I think it gives some really compelling transportive listening experiences um, so this is me in the OB van at the venue we were monitoring in real time using these binaural techniques so you can represent a loudspeaker production over headphones which is what we were doing and mixing in real time um, one of the last ones I'll talk about is a collaborative project that we're doing with the University of Salford and uh, other partners, including Technicolor. Um, the BBC doesn't actually work on the audio aspect of this project, but there we captured the sounds at this uh, local football pitch in, in 3D using a 32 capsule microphone array and capturing all of the microphones around the pitch that are used for the normal broadcast. Um, and this is intended to give an interactive experience for uh, immersive sound and video as well. Um, Fascinate Project has a website which is there if you want to learn more about that. Um, do you think that's enough for now? Cool. So that gives you an idea of the projects that are going on. I think one very important point that was mentioned uh, was of this object based surround sound. Uh, I think up until now we had mono, then we went to stereo, and then we went to 5.1. Uh, there are other formats like 7.1 and 6.1 but they are fixed loudspeaker arrangements and you mix and the mix is flat. It always plays back and okay, you can down mix it. The whole concept of object based is very interesting because all of a sudden you are describing a three dimensional uh, space. Uh, you might have one given three dimensional ambience and then lots of objects which have a position in space. What that means is if you then play it back over, you know, 22.2, that will work fine because you can map that. But if you want to play it back over 5.1 uh, and stereo, that will also work. And I think this is a very exciting prospect. Uh, if you mention this to uh, console manufacturers for live broadcast, they must really die of a heart attack because it's a completely different approach to working. Um, but this is very interesting. So anyone wants to pick up the 
bit more on this object-based stuff? Yeah, I, I guess I, I can a little bit. So um, just coming back to a, a couple of things, coming back to a couple of things that, uh, that that Peter and actually kind of Chris mentioned about, you know, this this multitude of different loudspeaker technologies, rendering technologies. You know, we ask people how many speakers do you think you know you would like in a in a next generation technology, and the answers range somewhere from between. Have you seen my 80-inch telly and the, uh, the really narrow speakers it's got on it? Can you just make that sound really good to, well, how many can you do? So I think what we really can get from that is that having another technology that's just another X.1 really isn't any sort of development. It's, it's, a, it's an evolution rather than a revolution. And I think you know, we're at the point now where we have to start thinking about revolution. So you know, in, in my heart, um, you know, object-orientated is, is the way to go. Now, we were discussing earlier a, a little bit about kind of what does object-oriented actually mean? Does it mean that we're placing a bunch of objects on a, on a sphere sitting around us? Or alternatively, are we, like you would in a, in, a, in a game engine, for instance, putting together a whole bunch of objects in space and then placing yourself in that space? So I think it's, it's, it's important that you know, object-oriented isn't just necessarily placing objects on a sphere. It might also be about placing objects in a 3D space, as, as, as Peter intimated, and then being able to move yourself around that space as well. Now, that is extremely powerful, but of course, we then need to think, OK, well, how are we actually going to be delivering that to the end consumer? That is extremely hard. It's extremely hard to be delivering you know, X number of objects. I mean, how many do you want? 64, 256? How do we deliver all those objects to the home? How do we put in the home something that is going to be able to do uh, you know a significantly good job of rendering all those objects um, in real time, and also you know, if we think about we're having to deliver all these objects, and we may want to think about okay, well we might want a 5.1 base and then add all these objects in. What happens when we have a really busy time? What happens when you know Arnold Schwarzenegger is walking through the wall and breaking stuff, and we've got you know 60, 70 objects going on at once? The bit rate for this delivery is then going to spike now variable bitrate audio is very, very difficult to manage. Um, and you know, if we're trying to deliver a number of services, each with uh, you know, a highly variable bitrate just due to the audio, do we really want to get to the point where, I don't know, on, the, on Sky Movies HHD1, we have Arnold Schwarzenegger going through the wall, and then uh, on Sky Sports HD2, all of a sudden the bitrate drops on the video, and uh, you know, we're, we're then in, in a lot of trouble. So these are the, these are the sort of things that have to be considered, and they're, they're not easy questions. I'm hoping you can uh, give us some answers. Yeah, and I, th I think it relates to the storytelling experience as well. So audio comes to you, right, either directly or through reflections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, when you're in an auditorium and you're you're listening to a choir, it is fine. But as you know, directors kind of like multiple camera views, and they like to switch between those. So then what, what do you do then? You know, if you've rendered these objects that appear in spaces, do, do they sit there? Or do suddenly now you have to shift them around? And then what does that do to your experience? Do you suddenly feel that actually I was here and now I'm sitting over there? And does that break the illusion? Because really what we're trying to get to with 3D sound and even 3D video is try and keep that, that level of immersion, try and make it more real. And as soon as you break any of those cues, whether they're visual or audio cues, then you, you break that illusion. I think uh, Do you wanna I was just going to say a quick word on that. Um, I think it's hope that particular aspects of it, I'm not sure will be uh, necessarily a big problem, but I accept that it's, it's as we, we move into two and then three dimensions, it's, it becomes more of a perceptual issue. But there's a, there is a, a sort of fundamental difference between how the eye perceives and how the ear perceives, which we've, we've always exploited in the past to the extent that it's always uh, it, well. It's become an accepted convention that, that from a visual perspective, you can jump viewpoints, yep. jump sizes of shot, and many times there's been the debate about what you should do with the audio perspectives, etc. And I think we probably in this room all agreed that what you'd never want to do is actually change the position of the, of the listener, if you like. Well, even though they're ostensibly changing in terms of their visual viewpoint. If you cut the audio perspective around to match that, it's just not natural. It's not a convention that, that we would accept. So you start off, the premise that we've always started off doing in our surround coverage is that you have a sort of core surround picture from one viewpoint. And then in the way that object embedding would develop, 
the, the idea, you then use individual mics to place things within that, that sphere. But what you don't try and do is move things around when you move from one goal to the other goal in the football match, for example. Although one ironic example of that is that we do have a mixer who likes to change which end in cricket the, the, the uh, perspective is from. Um, but there's actually a practical value to do with that as well. Um, and if you ever listen to Sky Cricket in 5.1, I challenge you to actually hear between the overs that the perspective does change because that's a, a situation where you've got time to do a very gradual transition so that nobody notices, but you end up with this perspective. But if you, if you carry on that analogy with a cricket ground, if you, um, if you imagine, for instance, that the Barmy Army is singing in one point in the ground, and in the, in the acoustic perspective, it's sort of over there. In a wide shot of that ground, you'll never be able to see where they are in the crowd. And when there's a close-up, you don't, it's not locating it within the perspective. So actually, it, as long as you keep the perspective in the wide oral shot of where that crowd is the same, the visuals can change around. So that actually makes it easier in some ways for what we want to do with objects embedding. But if you then develop the discussion into the concept of virtual reality, say, and not that we're going there today, but then, and then you're starting to move the body, that throws up a whole different issue. So the whole concept of being able to encode the information to allow you to decode it in a variable way, I think is one of the, one of the issues that we're looking at here. But as, as, as Mark's pointed out, the, the, one of the issues that we haven't yet covered is the technology to allow things like the bit rates to do this kind of thing, but it will come. Yeah, so, so actually on, on, the, on a part, point that Martin made there, um, you know, perhaps we can distinguish these, uh, th these two methods between the two methods of, of object-oriented uh, delivery. So let's say you know, if we had a single point in space um, or where we were, where we were, were filming from, like uh, like Sky do with the, with, with the 3D and the football, you know, it's all very slow pans and there's not a lot of fast cuts. If you have a fast cut and you move the audio with that fast cut, then yeah, the brain gets confused, says, you know, you, you, you lose that uh, suspension of disbelief. Um, and you realize that actually, you know, this is not me, I'm not moving from here to here in, in real time. However, if, you know, we could move to this more virtual reality kind of, kind of way and the, the uh, you know, the user were able to move themselves around in a, in a kind of relatively slow way, then also if the audio changed in a relatively slow way, you're no longer just not you know losing that sense of disbelief because essentially you're just flying around moving yourself around as long as you don't move from place to place so maybe we could equate um, you know the, the changing of the audio soundscape with uh, the, the virtual um, 3d or a single point with something a bit more a bit more stable so uh, I just wanted to follow that up um, First of all, I think one of the things we aim to do in, in BBC R&D is to uh, try and answer these questions in terms of what the audience actually wants. We've got a lot more capability in terms of both audio and visual immersion. Um, and we could turn that into a kind of virtual reality experience where you're getting a first person view of things. But is that what people want? That's not how we currently experience audio or visual uh, information on the television. Um, on the flip side, as well with this uh, object oriented approach, there are other advantages apart from audio immersion. For example, if we want to provide accessible services, um, making the speech clearer for people who find it harder to, to understand what's being said, an object based approach would be uh, really useful because you, know, you can know in the metadata what is speech, what is incidental effects, what's music. Um, so, yeah, there, there are many advantages to object based audio. The other thing is that um, loudspeaker-based approaches can still be represented in, in the object world because each loudspeaker signal can be an object with a position in space. So there's backwards compatibility as well, which is useful. Yeah, I, th I think backwards compatibility is a, a very important uh, issue. Uh, if you just purely look at 5.1 right now, the biggest issue in broadcast right now, although a lot of broadcasters will deny this, is down mix compatibility. Uh, I know Sky have worked very, very hard ever since they started looking at 5.1 to ensure they had stereo and mono compatibility. John will be able to give us the exact figures of how many people are actually listening to 5.1, uh, but I, I imagine percentage-wise, wise, that's quite low. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, Sky have been doing surround sound for some considerable time, right? 
since our Sky PVRs come out, so what's that, 2002? Uh, and obviously that, that's grown as we've got our HD channels, we tend to make sure that they've got some form of surround sound as well. So it's, it's, we've invested heavily. Uh, we're the first ones to do it on sport as well, I believe. So uh, w whether customers are actually listening to it or not is, is another interesting debate. And uh, I can't actually share the numbers with you, but it's, it's not as high as certainly I would want it. Um, and I'm sure there's, there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, it's, there, there is a, I think, aesthetically, just the whole thing about running speakers around your home is, is a challenge. It's a challenge for customers. And then even if they have gone to that trouble, if it's not uh, a pass-through system, uh, it's what drives them to get off the sofa, run over, turn the surround sound, switch to the AV that they need, and then listen to it as well. So it's, it's, it's a challenge. So we can talk about object oriented sound. Ours is just a challenge of trying to convince people that actually surround sound adds to that experience. There's no end of research, which these guys have probably all read as well, which shows you that surround sound has a, has a massive part to play, not just on that more immersive experience, but actually making you fool your brain into the video quality looking better. Um, but I think there is an opportunity through tablets, through binaural, through trying to educate customers that you've got a captured audience there, you know they've got a pair of headphones on, and then being able to give them a more immersive sound, I would say a 5.1, but certainly a more immersive sound experience, which then leads them to question why they're not getting that experience at home. Uh, so that may help drive sales and drive awareness through that way. Um, like I said, the hardest thing to do is, is to demonstrate it. I mean, we have 350 stores throughout the UK and Republic of Ireland. Uh, we are challenged to try and give that surround sound experience in those environments just because we can't pollute the sound around, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, and I think part of that challenge, obviously, a lot of these decisions will be commercial decisions, yeah. whether to invest more into 3D sound and so on. So I think the more and more people do research in the binaural side, all of a sudden, 3D sound makes a lot more sense from a commercial point of view. So I think they kind of have to go hand in hand in order to make it happen in, in broadcast within the medium term. It's not going to happen tomorrow. If we just maybe Martin you can shed a little bit more light you know when you switched from stereo to 5.1 uh, everyone now takes it for granted you look at uh, a nice console and it's all there and it's all set up uh, for 5.1 but I mean in the early days that was definitely not the case and as far as I know you're still hammering on broadcast uh, on console manufacturers to keep on improving and this is just 5.1 so I'd imagine the hurdle to go higher channel counts, maybe object-based, um, you know, from a live production point of view, it's got to be enormous. Yeah, there's two areas I think I'd like to pick up on there. The, one of them you touched on uh, a few minutes ago, but taking the last point first, the console manufacturers, in, in certainly in TV broadcast, for live broadcast, have come a long way very quickly. Um, it's been a very interactive process. Um, for example, a very pragmatic approach that uh, one of the console manufacturers we use a lot has always treated the 5.1 as two stereos and two monos. So the front left right is treated as a stereo pair and the rear left right is treated as a stereo pair on one stereo fader if you like. So you can end up manipulating the 5.1 uh, across just four faders when it's as it were broken out or spilled out as we call it. But you can then wrap all that signal back up into one fader for the uh, when you don't need to break it down into pieces to modify. So in the general trend of things, you, if you've got a, for instance, a, a 5.1 output from a, a Soundfield microphone, which we, uh, which the Soundfield company, which we use a lot of because of the phase coherence that we get talking about down mixing, uh, that would normally be on the on the top surface of the console as a single fader. And then if you need to tweak, say, the, rear, the level of the rears, you can then spill that out to some faders that control it. So that's one practical way that we've moved from having mono one channel to stereo two channels, but you can put them on one fader. It's the same kind of concept. So it's just another uh, level of spill out, if you like. So 5.1 happens to be six channels. So that's a way of dealing with six channels. Um, Going on to the down mix side of it though, a lot of people don't understand that on the Sky HD platform, the audio that's transmitted is always some flavor of Dolby Digital. 
So if there is a surround signal there, it'll be Dolby Digital 5.1. If it's a stereo-only program, it's Dolby Digital 2.0. Now, the importance of that is that when there is a 5.1 program going out, there isn't a stereo signal being broadcast on the HD platform. There is only that 5.1 signal. It's different on the SD platform, apart from movies, which can have surround sound. But on the sports, for instance, on the SD platform, which are not 5.1 enabled, that's normal MPEG audio. So there's always a stereo signal there. So now we've got two potential stereo signals at home. If we've got a 5.1 football match, say, and it's going out on HD and on SD, on the HD platform in 5.1, if you're listening at home in stereo, you don't hear a specific transmitted stereo mix, you hear a down mix made in your home, in your set-top box from the 5.1. Whereas on the SD platform, the broadcaster's already made a stereo mix at site, if you like, which they're transmitting. So we have to make a stereo mix that we send on the SD that matches what your set-top box will down mix at home. So we actually have to start from the premise that the 5.1 mix has to work when it's down mixed to stereo, which is a point that sometimes, for instance, in, in post-production, people often miss because they, they work on the 5.1 mix and then they'll make a stereo mix. But what they don't remember is that the stereo mix will never be heard by any HD viewer they'll hear a down mix of the 5.1. So you have to listen to the down mix. So that then brings into the issue of the compatibility of that down mix and phase and things like that. So those are considerations that go right back to the premise of how you're going to generate your 5.1 and taking those, those uh, requirements into account simultaneously. If you then move on to the, the virtual area at the moment of objects uh, coding and ambisonics, you still got the issue of what about the mono listener on a mobile phone or the stereo listener on headphones or stereo listener at home or we need to be able to make it so that you can get a 5.1 output of that for people who still want to use that sort of system not to mention all the pre-production technologies that we haven't haven't actually rolled out yet so there's a, a lot of questions there about uh, how you would generate the signal and how you in practical terms would record it and uh, distribute it uh, before you get to the transmission and set-top box point. So there's a whole generation of things that I think need to all gel together. And that we're at the early stages of it, which is, of course is always an exciting place to be because the possibilities are, are almost endless. That's why there's so much research work going on. Um, but as I think Mark said, it's, it's more of a, a revolution than, a gen uh, than an evolution that we're having to start to look at now. But in practical terms, it will always need to be implemented, as everything ever has been in broadcasting, as, as a, an evolutionary thing. You take even stereo radio using a pilot tone so that you still transmitted the mono signal. So you've always got to make things backward compatible, and that's going to be one of the big challenges as well, I think. So yeah, on the on the evolution and revolution thing, I think it's it, 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 we we need to really decide where we want to go. We want to decide. Look, are we going to start something completely new and then make uh, you know the platforms that we have work with it, or are we going to you know start with the premise that you know we have to um, you know we, we have to have a you know stereo capacity. We have to like kind of have a 5.1 as well that we are going to deliver. I mean, I, I guess from a broadcast operator point of view, it would be better just to say, okay, well, we'll get rid of everything and we'll just monocast this new format, whatever it is. But then, of course, in the background, you've got the headache, of, not the headache, the, uh, you know, the, the headache of your customers, the headache of, um, you know, the, the probably vast majority of people, I, I guess, at the moment who are, who are still listening in stereo. Um, going, going to uh, John's point about like, uh, getting people to experience this, you know, we, we have like, kind of much the same sort of thing, you know, it would be, it'd be great to be able to get people to experience it, you know, if they're not experiencing it because they haven't got 5.1 um, let's get them to experience it in a way that everybody listens everybody the vast majority of people will be listening to some sort of stereo what it, and, and what that might be but I think yeah it, it would be good to like kind of at least ascertain whether we want to start anew and then make it work with the platforms we have or if we start from the point that we say okay well we're gonna have a 5.1 base let's say for instance and any objects will fit around that then of course you have the, the, the issue that if you want to do that you then might need to be able to remove those five point, those uh, objects from an original 5.1 mix. If you're going to deliver a 5.1 compatible mix for, for the legacy that you have, but you're also going to deliver the objects as well, 
you've got two options. Either you can not have those objects in the 5.1 and you need to add them, in which case your legacy has gone out the window, or you deliver 5.1 and then try and remove those objects from that 5.1. Now, I think that is probably impossible, um, mainly due to the fact that uh, you know, you're gonna have to have the same sort of like kind of panning mixes in your, in your, um, in, in your uh, you know, kind of $10 box or $10 silicon box as you are in your, um, in your you know, kind of quarter of a million pound mixing console. And to be able to do that and remove it is, is gonna be, I, I would imagine, very, very difficult indeed. Um, but you know, if, if we want to stick with, with legacy, then that's what we're going to have to do. Yeah, I just had. Um, so I think w one of the challenges that we'll face beyond making making it physically possible, which is probably uh, large enough as it is, is is giving the production teams the confidence that the the piece, the artistic piece that they create, can be faithfully represented in whatever listening format the audience has. Um, because we've got, say, these objects that tell, it, tell the system where things should be. But if there's no speakers there, if, the, if it's just one speaker underneath the television, then clearly that's not going to be faithfully represented. So the, the, the final systems that make it to the public will, will have to first instill confidence in the production teams that they can do their content justice. Uh, I think that's a big challenge as well. I think from a purely on a practical broadcast point of view, I think if we're going to make this leap, and it's an enormous leap, it almost has to be, as it's turned out for 5.1, you produce in this new format, and then you have to down mix whatever shape or form that may take. It's not so straightforward anymore as it is with 5.1 down to stereo, but you'd have to create everything within this one format. Um, you know, it, it's when, when any broadcaster now goes and does a, an HD uh, football game, for example, they don't have an HD truck and then next to it an SD truck. It's, it's completely impossible. The, the expense of this is, well, ridiculous. Uh, and you can do this maybe whilst you're doing some trials, but once this is reality, it's one truck. So the same will have to happen if we take this leap is, okay, there will be the initial trials, but then you have to come up with a solution um, that works in this new format, but can deliver 5.1 stereo and mono, even if that means we are using for standard HD with Dolby Digital um, or DD Plus, we will be using a 5.1 down mix and maybe the set top box is not seeing any of the advanced kind of object based stuff, uh, but then there could be a new delivery format and maybe, maybe something that Dolby might bring out in the future that might be object based. So I think that would be a way around it. I think if we go all of a sudden into you know, everything is object based and you have to throw all your set top boxes away. Uh, it's just never going to happen. So I think, I think we have to find a way where the production happens in potentially a new format and then we find, you know, derivatives thereof which can go down the current paths, even for SD and stereo and, and so on, because SD is not dead yet. Um, so, you know, it's still, it's still all there. So I think the legacy part is, you know, um, a, a big challenge. Um, any questions at all from the floor? Uh, you want to raise. Ian, you must have something. Hang on, I'll bring you the mic. Um, I just wondered if we do go object based and you're delivering into someone's environment, will they then have greater choice of what they do depending on their interface? I mean, whereas now we do 5.1, the speakers are in a fixed format how 5.1 should be. If you're delivering a new format, could you decide to sit with elbow on the stage rather than back in the audience? In which case, do you make up a legacy mix in the truck? And you say, well, that's available. But the guys who are then into the object-based delivery, they can do what they like with it in terms of what their interface is. And that's a very good point. Uh, and it's something that immediately comes up when you think how much information you're going to have about the scene. Um, I think the question is really what's appropriate. First of all, you probably need to ask the audience what, what they want. Um, and the other thing is there's, there's lots of different levels of um, acceptance within the audience to this kind of thing. So some people are faced with the option to stand wherever they want in the room and not going to know what to do. And they'll probably stand in the corner facing the wall kind of thing. But um, So I think you need to be able to, to give people solid options that they know are going to have good quality. But yeah, it may be that in a more advanced setup, you might start to offer this kind of thing, um, give people the freedom to explore 
clearly, t to make that realistic, there's a lot of technological advancements that need to go on beyond just saying, there's a guitar there, and I have this mono signal that represents it. Um, yeah, but it's an interesting point. Just quickly to add to that, something you, you reminded me of. Um, I remember many years ago, there was talk about uh, being able to transmit more than one camera picture so that people could actually effectively do their own cut of the show at home on sport or something. And I think it was the BBC actually did the experiment. And the problem they found was that although it sounded like a great idea, actually most of the time you want to watch, sit down and watch a TV programme. You don't want to be faffed with having to choose shots and things. It's great for a while, but most of the time you want someone else to do all that work. And it's exactly the same with audio. So there's, a, there's, there's probably a limit at what value there is in giving people total control in a complicated way, as I think we can all agree this is beginning to sound like it might be for a professional mixer. Are people really at home going to want to sit down and have it to position 20 different objects and play about with it? Yeah, cause yes, because they will for novelty value, but when they want to sit down and watch a programme, they just want it to, to be done in, by a professional in the, in, a, in the best possible way to be presented to them in the most compatible way. So I think that's an aspect that we need to bear in mind all the time as well. So I think you're right. I think when we, um, we've done uh, via Sky Sports player tracking and uh, we've had cameras either end of the goal and it was used by some people, it was used by every. I think sometimes you have to think that the TV is obviously a shared viewing medium. Uh, so anything you do on that big screen, you're infecting everybody. Uh, that said, I think as we start to push on, we start to see these companion devices, second screen devices, uh, you get the kind of lean back experience you get with the big screen, but you also get a kind of lean forward experience. And maybe, I mean, I think we can talk about 3D old range sound, but really, when it comes to actually selling this as a product and getting it out to customers, there's got to be a damn good reason why they're going to update their, their amplifiers, why the broadcasters are going to do it. So it, it has to be some kind of step change. And yeah, I, I'd love to be able to watch uh, sport where I can then choose to sit with the Arsenal fans or with the Tottenham fans. And I think those type of features are, are likely to get me more interested to, to buy into 3D audio than just trying to you know, recreate something that's kind of fixed. So, so I think we're saying the answer to your question is yes, it does allow more flexibility. I think we're, we're just trying to decide whether it's a, it's a good idea to give that flexibility to the user or not. Um, now, as we have with uh, kind of professional pieces of equipment, you know, we're, we're all like kind of sound engineers, we all like kind of, uh, you know, have a, have a lot of equipment to work with. We don't all necessarily know exactly how that equipment works. We know what we need to do to be able to make that piece of equipment work. And I think the consumer is, is very same, is exactly the same. If they want the flexibility, then you know, it should be made available, but we should at least like, have some sort of basic setting to allow these people to use. And if we don't, it then becomes um, you know, kind of unmanageable. The second thing to just, just to say there as well is that, of course, you know, the number of speakers that a user has and you know, the position that they're in is, um, is also a user setting of sorts. It's something that they will set up at, at the beginning and then they can set it and forget it. So I think you know, that's a, another benefit that we have with object oriented, that we can much better attune the delivery that the customer gets to exactly what they have in their home, you know, which is something that, that all sorts of metadata does. You know, the, the down mix metadata that we have currently allows people to you know, have a sensible down mix from, from 5.1 to stereo, regardless of, uh, of what piece of equipment they have in their home. I think here it's not just about 3D sound, but it's also, as, as John uh, alluded to, a shift in how people view. Um, when I watch TV, I'm old fashioned. I sit on a sofa, I have a beer and I watch the TV and I don't want to do anything. Uh, and hopefully the loudness is good so I don't even have to ride the volume. Um, but you know, a lot more people, they don't watch TV. Younger people, they do not watch TV. They, that's not what they have. They have computers, they have tablets and they interact a lot more. Uh, if you have to change cameras with your remote control and then there's like a two second lag when you press the button, mm -hmm. it's not a great user experience. But if you had a tablet and you could kind of flick your finger and it smoothly changed and all the sound changed on your headphones and you're in 3D, I think all of a sudden it's a very nice experience, potentially. Maybe not for me because I like to just kick back with a beer. But I think there's a whole generation of people coming up who view a lot different. They don't watch something for four hours. They watch two minutes here, 30 seconds there. So it's very, very short time span and they might want to flick around and play around with it. So I think at the same time as we're looking at 3D sound, I think, you know, and, and you will have, John, you will have done a lot of research on this. I presume a lot of people 
are consuming this kind of products completely different way. They are, and I think it's up to now. Uh, the, the, there is a slight boom, and uh, I don't want to say a bubble around these companion devices and second screen devices. And of most of the apps I've seen, that there's nothing there that's been particularly exciting. The content that you see on your big screen is the content you see on, on your on your smaller screen. It's kind of simulcast, uh, and I think that's got to change. Uh, the, these applications and these devices have a lot more. Uh, ways of interacting with them. So, and I think longer term, I think there's also a feedback loop that goes from the device that you're playing out, its capabilities to feed that back to how whatever server or broadcaster is broadcasting that out to make sure that that experience that you're getting via that particular device or that screen, and it may go beyond just tablets as well. I know they're very fashionable at the moment, but yeah, you know, tablets may even get bigger, uh, in my view. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I think it's 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 I think it's got to change, and I think it has to go all the way back even to the storyteller and the directors and the people that commission the content to think about how they're going to use these devices and how they're going to use 3D audio to tell that story. Okay, um, as you can tell, we are really, really, really scratching the surface. I think every single point that was raised could have taken a day. Um, Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So hopefully they gave you a bit of an idea of the thought patterns that are going on within broadcast, uh, potentially towards 3D audio. Uh, I think there's definitely a very exciting opportunity there, uh, but it's just how we can make it happen. One quick question. Just a last question. Can, can you recommend any websites or links where questions like this are further explored? And because as you say that we need more time. Well, no, it, it is a good point. And to be honest, um, I think very little of this talk has been really going on from an implementation point of view. I think most of the panels on 3D sound have been about how they went about it, what microphones they used, what loudspeaker uh, layouts they used, and so on. So this is kind of, OK, there's a lot of research. How can we capitalize on that? So I think in this point at the moment, there most probably isn't. But who knows? Watch this space, and maybe something will develop out of this. You know, this, this is a bit of a let's throw it out there and see kind of panel. So, um, so there, there is um, a very old fashioned style mailing list called Sur Sound, which you might be able to find if you search it. So S-U-R Sound. Uh, a lot of very technical discussion goes on there about implementations, but there's also a, a wide community that, that work on this as researchers. And I'm sure if you have questions, they'd be very welcoming and uh, provide you with some background information if you wanted it. Um, I'm just going to do my plug now, if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, another thing is you can go on the BBC website uh, right now and experience surround sound on headphones. So um, this is binaural modeling of 5.1 surround sound. Sorry? Uh, yeah, so uh, the page is there, and those are the links. Um, so basically, there's a podcast to download, and you can listen to virtual surround sound. Uh, there's four different versions, and there's a survey accessible from our blog. Uh, the, it ends tomorrow, so if you want to check it out, it's your last chance, um, and we'd appreciate your feedback. Excellent. I, I think we have to wrap it up, because I think there's someone on. Uh, on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. And uh, any questions will be around for a bit, I'm sure. Thanks.